Port in the Storm by Duncan Wog, read by Delio Pera. Crammed together in the tight confines of their repressor transport, Sirius and the rest of his Adeptus Arbides squad checked over their gear as the vehicle hammered down the city streets. The arbitrator held a bracing strut as he shouted to be heard over the noise of the engine. From what we've been told, they've dutched down in one of the industrial sectors. Local planetary elements are en route to set up a perimeter, but you all know how that goes. Don't suppose anybody had the bright idea to shoot the thing down before it made landfall in the first place? Yearn, one of the other enforcers, asked as he tightened the strapping of his carapace armor. Sirius smiled wryly. Our esteemed planetary governor was likely too busy wringing his hands to actually make a decision before it was too late. So here we are. Wonderful. One of the others grunted diversively. Yes, well, Sirius continued, everyone look lively because we need to keep this contained. As they cleared the boarding hatch, Sirius and his squad looked over at the scene laid out before them. The refugee's lander had come down among some partially cleared industrial wasteland where Mesmok's planet-wide jungle had already started to reassert itself. The ship's disheveled human cargo had already started to disperse, angling away from the landing craft's hull. A second repressor skidded to a halt alongside them, the team of his counterpart, Lear, disembarking from the vehicle in a manner of moments. The other squad leader approached, his movement swift and tight as he spoke. That's a lot of people. We're going to have to manage this situation before it becomes completely uncontrollable. Sirius turned and looked back at their two teams, who had already started fanning out. Why bother sending the numbers you need when you can just throw the Arbitides in, huh? That's the Emperor's own truth. The arbitrator clapped him on the arm. Apparently, some of the other teams have been encountering pretty serious cult activity on board some of these things. Keep your eyes open. Good to know, Sirius replied, the arbitrator grimacing as more and more people exited onto the open space. Many had to be supported by their peers, glassy-eyed and shell-shocked as their fellows struggled to bear their weight, but looking along their lines, Sirius could not see any visible signs of combat amongst them. He sniffed diversively in the hot jungle air. Throne, yet more of these lifeless husks. What do you think is wrong with them? Who knows? Lear responded. These refugee ships have been full of them. Come on, we have a job to do. Weapon! The warning went out, followed immediately by the booming report of a shotgun being fired. All around him, the rest of Sirius' squad reacted instantly, bringing their weapons up, training their blunt muzzles on the rest of the crowd. The arbitrator pulled his own gun tight into his shoulder, his eyes scanning back and forth across the panicked faces of the populace before him looking for telltale signs of moral rot or nascent heresy. It did not take long for the wailing and screaming to begin. From the corner of his eye, he could see the crumpled form of the man who had been shot, a crude stub gun laying by his corpse. Already, the mob were moving in, cramming around the hapless fool's body, waves of anger and indignation rolling out across the assembled mass. Children cried, men and women screamed, a palpable mixture of fear and despair coming off them as the stresses and frustrations of the past few months' fearful flight boiled over. Voices were raised in shrill prayers for deliverance. And then, as he continued to scan the throng in front of him, Sirius spotted what he was looking for. Standing out amongst the panicked masses was a face of pure, unbridled defiance. The muscles in the man's neck were taut and visibly pulsing as his young, dark eyes locked on the dead body. Suddenly, improvised projectiles began hammering into the Adeptus Arbites line as the refugees grabbed anything that was not nailed down to throw. Sirius shrugged off the rocks and debris that clattered heavily against his body armor and took one step into the no-man's land between the two groups, leveling his weapon at the malcontent before him. You! The man's eyes snapped instantaneously, a wildness to his movements. Get down on the ground in the Emperor's name, the arbitrator called out. One of his fellow enforcers moved up beside him, using the riot shield he was carrying to cover the pair of them, and Sirius felt a pat on his other shoulder as someone else moved up along his other side. 
The moment seemed to drag, the two men staring at one another in the midst of the surrounding chaos. Don't do it, he muttered under his breath, knowing full well what was about to happen. As if on cue, the young man in front of him threw his long duster open, revealing a slung auto pistol as he reached for the weapon. Sirius squeezed the trigger, feeling the satisfying thud of the weapon in his hands. His second shot blew out the other man's pelvis, hurling bloodily from his feet. Sirius forced himself back out of his tunnel vision, trying to regain some degree of situational awareness. A fist-sized rock slammed into the helmet of his comrade, staggering the man and causing the enforcer's grip on his shield to waver. Sirius managed to wrap a hand around the injured man's back plate before he fell, pulling him back into position. As Sirius checked back and forth across their line, he was finally able to take in the full chaos of the scene, their squads slowly being pushed back by the sheer weight of the missiles being thrown their way. This is getting out of hand, Yearn called out from behind. Then a series of angry buzzing sounds went flying past his head, their proximity sending a cold shiver down Sirius's spine. Those had been autogun rounds. Where did that come from? He shouted desperately. I see them! Yearn replied, another series of cracks, followed by more buzzing, though less angry this time. Then a heavy weight crashed into Sirius from behind. He twisted to check behind him. Down on his knees, Yearn tried desperately to hold himself upright, propped up on one hand. The other hung limply, a darkness leaking from the armored plates covering that side of his chest. His fellow arbitrator tried to say something, but all that came out of his mouth was a crackly, wheezing sound. Sirius tightened up the sling on his shotgun, cinching it in tight to his body, and hammered the shield bear on the man's shoulder, shouting to be heard over the screaming crowd. Help me! Groggily, the man eyed the fallen arbitrator. Sirius was almost certain the enforcer had suffered a concussion from the earlier impact, and the two of them picked Yearn up one either side of him as they hurriedly dragged him back to the idling form of their repressor. We need to pull back and regroup, the arbitrator called out to the others as they hurriedly loaded urine into the back of the transport. The team's Medicaid worked quickly on urine's body, stripping off the man's armor in an attempt to get to the bullet wound as their small convoy raced down a number of small side alleys. Even here, the frontier world's voracious flora was struggling to force its way back into the Manufactura district with creeping vines and twisted, sickly-looking saplings having seeded themselves along the edge of the road. We're getting more reports of unauthorized landings, the vehicle's driver shouted over his shoulder to the assembled group. There are conflict zones emerging all the way from the slum habs to Penitent Square. Emperor, how is that possible? Someone shouted. The driver swerved suddenly to avoid a toppled and shattered statue of St. Chet before continuing. It would appear that our quarantine procedures were not as stringent as originally thought. The speaker turned to Sirius. You think it's related to those reports of mutant covens we've been hearing about? How in the Emperor's name would I know? The arbitrator replied, turning back to the driver. Try and raise the precinct fortress. We need to know what we're doing with... The next thing Sirius knew, he was crushed up against the inside of the APC, the weight of one of his teammates pressing up against him, his hearing ringing from some kind of explosion. The men around him struggled to regain their sense of balance. Looks of uncomprehending shock written across many of their faces. Pushing the other soldier off him, Sirius felt reassured to realize that their vehicle was at least still the right way up and leaned over to look out the side viewports. The other repressor had not fared so well. It was now little more than a burning wreck, its hull completely engulfed in flames. With no time to dwell on what had just befallen his fellow enforcers, the arbitrator stumbled his way up to the driver's compartment, screaming in the man's ear to try and be heard, Get us out of here! I can't! The driver, Denlin, struggled with the controls. The right track's blown. She won't move. Sirius swore loudly as the sound of small arms fire rattled off their vehicle. Looking out of the cracked front hatch, it did not take him long to spot the hab stack from which they were being fired upon. I don't wish to preach the confessor here, sir, 
said Denlin as he turned to Sirius and pointed at the wrecked repressor. But I don't want to be here when they reload whatever just did that. Sirius turned back to the rest of the team, alarm apparent in his voice. Everybody out, now! If we're going to repair that track, we have to clear them out first, Sirius thought out loud. What about those people back there? If what we've been hearing about these rampant mutations amongst the refugees is true, we can't just let them go. One of the other Arbitites, Jova, spoke up. And how are we going to do that? The arbitrator snapped. There's only a handful of us. We don't even know why all these people are coming here. Yearn struggled to speak through his injury, immediately bursting into a coughing fit after managing to get the words out. I heard things on the Vox, fragments of intercepts from the lander's crew. Denlin spoke up pensively, the group turning to look at him. Something about a vast blackness, an emptiness, he pointed up to the sky. Out there. You think you're going to get any sense out of those people? Jova smirked. You saw the state they were in. They barely even knew where they were. They're probably heretics. There was something else, too. Denlin's tone had grown somber. The other teams... They reported seeing some strange things among some of the escapees. Sirius regarded the enforcers coolly. It was no time for any of them to start cracking up under the pressure. Hold it together. Offer up a prayer if you have to. We're going to clear this building, fix our repressor, and find out what in the Emperor's name is going on. The able-bodied members of the team moved swiftly through the abandoned hablock climbing the stairwell towards the floors that they had taken fire from. Along the way, they encountered sporadic resistance. Evidently, some amongst the escaping civilians had managed to sneak a few basic weapons past the security checks before they had disappeared into the local populace. Reaching the top story of the building, Denlin, whose nerves had been growing increasingly strained, started to mutter under his breath, drawing concerned looks from the rest of the team. You don't hear that? He finally said, Keep noise to a minimum, Sirius whispered back harshly. I can hear her voice, Denlin continued, his eyes flicking back and forth between the other Arbites looking for validation, as easily as any of yours. Sirius was getting increasingly frustrated with the Enforcer. The trials of the day made it feel as if something was raking its way over his brain, and Denlin's ramblings were stoking the fires of superstitious dread within Sirius's chest. What if the refugees had brought some manner of witchery with them to Mesmach? I swear by the throne, Denlin, if you don't quiet down, I'll knock you out myself, he said, glaring at the man. She says we shouldn't be here, was all Denlin replied. His eyes glazed over and unfocused. Sirius shook his head with disgust, motioning to the others. Come on. The group moved down the dilapidated corridor, their movements tight and in sync with one another. Small rooms led off to either side, which they checked and cleared as they moved, following the hallway down as it fed into a single large space. Sitting in the middle of the room, cradling her knees into her body, was a young woman. Sirius watched her as the rest of the team checked the corners. As far as he could make out, the frail, rags-covered creature was unarmed. Seeing no apparent threat, he allowed his weapon to lower. One of the other enforcers slung his shotgun behind him and approached her, one hand held open invitingly. It's going to be okay, you can trust me. The girl looked up slowly, her wide eyes making contact with the man before taking in the rest of their group. Hesitantly, she stood up, and Sirius' teammate took another step forward. Where's the missile launcher? Denlin's voice trembled. Sirius's patience was wearing thin with the man, and he cast a sidelong glance at him. What? The missile launcher? The man's eyes were unnervingly bright, crazed almost. The one that blew up Lear's old team. We haven't found one. Denlin's weapon was still trained on the girl, his arms visibly shaking. And she is all that's left. Pull yourself together, Sirius snarled. But when he returned his gaze to the woman, even he could sense that something had changed, and now his instincts were screaming of witchcraft. Did she look as small and weak as she had before? She watched him calmly as she moved the hair out of her face. Was there something else there, behind those eyes? The arbitrator had spent years learning to read people, 
Time and again, he had found that listening to one's gut was the best way to stay alive. And yet, things in that moment were rapidly starting to feel off to him. Those eyes, he tried to break away from them, but they bore into him, the weight of a shotgun seeming to grow with every passing moment. She said not to come. Denlin's voice sounded distant and muted. Sirius realized, with oddly detached surprise, that the girl was not blinking. Why wasn't she blinking? The man in front of him reached out to touch her, and a smile formed across the waif's face. The arbitrator tried to move, tried to call out a warning, but it felt like he was bound, his body chained, his mouth gagged. Denlin cried out. The young woman's eyes blazed with a sudden witch light. Everything exploded in bright green flame. When Sirius came to, his body hurt. The arbitrator struggled to breathe, his lungs creaking under the strain and his left arm refused to work at all. Upon opening his eyes, his brain struggled to take in what it was seeing. The entire back wall of the building had been blown out. The city and surrounding jungle were clearly visible through the open hole. Sickly green flames burned around what remained of the structure, and all that was left of his team was a series of charred corpses. Pulling himself to his feet with his good hand, he staggered forward, but could find no sign of the witch. He spun around at the sound of gunfire from outside, barely keeping his balance in the process. It was only then that he could take in the full turmoil that had enveloped the city below. From his vantage point, the arbitrator could see more of the grounded refugee ships, their aged, ravaged hulls spread out around the city and nestled in the jungle fringes. Taken in all at once, the sheer number of them was staggering, and as gunfire and explosions rang out from the hab blocks surrounding many of the evacuees' vessels, Sirius knew the situation had already escalated beyond any of their control. There was no way for his forces, or those of their ineffectual governor, to keep order in the face of such a mass influx of people. No matter what he did, Mesmok was doomed to drown under the weight of it all. The arbitrator sank to his knees, desperately besearching the only source of salvation he knew for help. Holy God, Emperor, I beg you, please... Hear your servant in this hour of need. Sirius felt the stone in his heart begin to lighten. I do not know the cause of this exodus. I do not know what malign force is assailing your divine creation. But I implore you, please calm these waters. Bring order to this chaos and peace to your congregation. As he opened his eyes and looked out at the destruction beyond, something told the arbitrator that his prayer would not go unanswered. Thanks for bearing through me with this one, on this one. This one was a struggle, a real struggle. Uh, I think the recording itself, looking at it unedited right now, as I'm reading, doing, well, doing, speaking right now, right at the end here, I'm guessing it's going to be about 15 minutes long, but it took me more than 45 minutes to do. Why? Because this story is written very poorly. I'm um, just, that's, that's, there, that's all there is to it. I enjoy the story quite a lot. I like what is being said and what, what is being explained. I just don't like I, how it is being done. There are so many things to pick apart here. Um, there almost in every paragraph, there is something that made me cringe or made me just go, why, why did you do that? I don't know if Duncan is not a, an English speaker, first and foremost, a native English speaker. If not, then that would explain this to some degree. Um, but if he is, then this is inexcusable, honestly. So let's just jump into it and I'll explain to you what I mean and, and why this is so challenging to read. And I don't, I don't know if it's as challenging to hear. I would imagine not, not quite so. It's the, the burden is more so on the, the reader's part, whether that's somebody reading it aloud or somebody reading it in their head. But the, the flaws really show up when, when, when it's read aloud. So as is a continual issue, we've got 
tons of adverbs here. In the fourth paragraph is where it all begins. Sirius smiled wryly. That doesn't help anything. It doesn't offer, it doesn't, it doesn't assist our mental imagery of the story at all. We just, he, seeing him smile is fine enough. Sirius smiled. That, that's plenty. What he goes on to say it does the job of Riley. Our esteemed planetary governor was likely too busy wringing his hands. That says plenty right there. Moving on to the very next paragraph. Some unnamed character uh, grunts derisively. That doesn't give us anything at all. Derisively. Again, right above the first little double-headed eagle, Aquila, we've got derisively again. Um, then I, I'm pausing here. So if this sounds a little bit choppy, it's because I don't want you to suffer through all the, let's see, where's the next one? Where's the next one? So let, let us find the next one. Here's another example of what I'm talking about. This is after the, the refugees have started throwing stuff at them. Sirius shrugged off the rocks and debris that clattered heavily against his body armor. It heavily doesn't add anything here to us or for us. It does not. It doesn't help us in any way whatsoever. Clattered against his body armor does everything that that handles the entirety of what we need to see there. Uh, then the very next paragraph, the man's eyes snapped up instantaneously. A wildness to his movements just snapped up. A wildness to his movements. We don't need instantaneously. Um, I do like this one paragraph here, though. One of his fellow enforcers moved up beside him, using the riot shield he was carrying to cover the pair of them, and Sirius felt a pat on his other shoulder as someone else moved up on the other side. I like that imagery there. Of Sirius is in front, one guy comes up alongside him, puts the riot shield to cover them, and then somebody else is up along the side, so I, I get the the visual image of like SEAL Team 6 stacking up on a door about to, to, to breach it. Um, moving on. Okay, this this paragraph here, it's a fairly short one, but it's after guns start going off, another series of cracks followed by more buzzing. It's it's right after that one. It starts out, Sirius tightened, the, I mean, we have tight here uh, too many times. Sirius tightened up the sling on his shotgun, cinching it in tight to his body and hammered the shield bear on the man's shoulder, shouting to be heard over the screaming crowd. That's all one sentence. The entire paragraph is one sentence tightened up the sling that's one tightened cinching it in tight i mean cinching is another version of tight completely unnecessary next the very next paragraph we've got groggly the man eyed the fallen arbiter sirius was almost certain the enforcer had suffered a concussion from the earlier impact and the two of them that doesn't okay why 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 do we need to know that it doesn't help here's another one where it's just utterly redundant uh we need to get pull back and regroup the the situation has already explained to us the the need for speed. They they need to move. There 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 is action being required of them. There things are happening at a very frantic pace. So we don't need the word hurriedly here, right above the the main image of the of the whole story, which doesn't really fit the story at all, as far as I can tell. I don't know. It's it's odd. We need to pull back and regroup, the arbiter called out to the others as they hurriedly loaded urn into the back of the transport. No shit you're going to be doing that hurriedly. That That is, as they, hur as they hurriedly, as opposed to just lazily, as opposed to just skipping along and just kind of dragging him with a lackadaisical, just not really care. No, of course you're moving your, your fellow comrade your your fallen buddy into the back of the transport to get the hell out of there as quick as you can. That's a given. That's that's just duh. Um, the adding these adverbs in here is like a war scene happening in a movie, and then a narrator coming on saying, "There's a lot of action here happening right now. Bullets are flying very quickly, and and the and the enemy is coming in fast over the hilltop, and and the soldiers are fighting." with every ounce of their strength. Yeah, we see that. We don't need you to tell us that, narrator. Why Why is that even in the movie? To what the hell? Um, so besides the, the I, I just have to say it, the, the not so great writing on this one. I just feel like these are first pass drafts often that aren't being read aloud by the authors. 
I feel that if they read their work aloud or had somebody read it aloud to them, they would catch many, many of these things. The story I like, this one actually has somewhat of an arc. There's something that actually happens and we have clear antagonists and we have clear protagonists. Unlike last week's story where it was just this gal and some prospectors, they're out on a planet and they're just driving along and we don't know what has befallen the mining camp. They're just kind of there, sort of staring off into nothing, or shambling around sort of like zombies, but they're not zombies. We, it's all very, oh, we don't know. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's, well, nobody thinks it's good, but what's going on? We don't know. Uh, confusion, lack of co- co- coherence. We, it's just nothing makes sense. This one, it's very clear. These guys are setting off right at the very beginning. Um, I didn't. I don't know if I said that right at all, the Adeptus Abides. I, I probably didn't. I didn't even know that these were a thing until the story today and then I looked up what they were and found this utterly massive wiki article on them this going back to I think all the way to first or second edition of Warhammer they're basically Judge Dread. they're they're judges from the Dredge Judge Dread universe um which I know almost nothing of as well I'm just aware of that being a thing so when I saw their helmets I thought oh that's Judge Dread. but apparently and it just says that right in the wiki article that they did were heavily inspired by those characters. So, okay, cool. No, I don't have a problem there. Um, so I do like there's, there's, a, there's a goal here. These uh, Adeptus Bites are going out to try and figure out what, where are these refugees coming from? Are they a threat? Is it, is it a problem? Yes, apparently so. And then they're trying to get the hell out of there. They're, they're attacked. Um, and then they're trying to get their buddy some help. And then they run into this gal. So there's a very clear story. There's it's something absolutely happens here. So I very much like that. And I thought the very final paragraph was probably the best one of the entire thing. So ending on the highest note in your entire story is a is, if that's a if you're going to do it, that's the way to do it. As he opened his eyes and looked out at the destruction beyond, something told the arbitrator that his prayer would not go unanswered. That I, I don't have much to say about that at all. There's no adverbs there. There's even the one right before it is pretty good. There's desperately beseeching the holy, the only source of salvation. Desperately, I, it's eh, it's okay. It's borderline. It's it's it it actually is 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 fine. There. It's it could the could the whole sentence been worded better? Probably. But as it is, I don't have a huge issue with it. So the story closes out really nicely. My issue with the story is the things like cinching tighten tight to his body not necessary hurriedly move their 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 comrade or their 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 fallen guy into into the the truck yeah no shit they were doing that hurriedly it's the adverbs and it's the the sloppy writing but that stuff aside good story just not written all that great like i started this out with um yeah, I've been enjoying doing these weekly stories. I like that they keep on pumping them out. I don't know if this was a thing that they were doing before the Psychic Awakening. I I got into Warhammer right around uh, the th- uh, November of last year. So I think Psychic Awakening started August or October of 2019. So I got in pretty early on into it and have been following the stories since. I don't know how the whole coronavirus thing is going to affect the the release of some of the, these things, but maybe 2020 will just be bam, 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 rapid fire release, release, release of all sorts of stuff, which would be super cool. Um, I know the Adeptus Mechanicus are getting some stuff real soon, and my wife is definitely excited about that. She told me she didn't like some of the wing designs, kind of the steampunk uh, Leonardo da Vinci sort of style looking things. I, I thought they were really cool. I, I like that a lot. And she told me recently that it's grown on her and she she's she's cool with it now. I think the the little rider guys are really cool. The flying dudes are sweet. I think that the whole line of new stuff is, is super cool. I'm hoping they get a, a big box set. That'd be nice for her to swoop up. Um, But I feel like we had our Adeptus Mechanicus stories already. Those came a couple weeks ago so that's what i'm talking about the releases i feel like the adeptus mechanics stuff should have already come out 
Um, and it hasn't. So I don't know what's going on there. All right. Uh, the only other thing that I have to say is if you've been enjoying my reading, then I encourage you to go and listen to some of the other stuff that I've been doing. I've been posting stories every single day except Wednesday when I post the Warhammer story. So I don't post one of my stories. I've got stuff scheduled all the way up until next week. And I've got, I think, 14 or 21 more stories to read in that universe. <clears throat> and I know I've been saying for a while now that I'm not going to read that other story until I hit a thousand subscribers, but I'm just going to kind of like I ranted in that one, the, the assassin story at the end of it, that long 30, 40 minute rant. I'm just going to do what I want to do, folks. If you like it, great. I hope you do, but I'm just going to be doing what I enjoy. And so once I get through all of those shorter stories, the ones that are anywhere from a minute and a half to three minutes long, I don't think many have been more than that, maybe a couple, but not, not many. I'm going to read that longer story. I believe it's about 10,000 words long, which is to give you an idea of how long that is. Actually, yeah, it's around 9,000, somewhere between 8 and, eight and 10,000 words long. The story that was read today, that I, that I read today for you, was 2,900 odd words long. So if that took me 15 minutes, then my story will take me about an hour. It, so if you like longer stuff and not just the real quick things, look forward to that. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot else to say. I don't like that I've gotten into this pattern of saying, talk to you soon, bye. I don't want to do that. I don't want to have catchphrases and things that are just, oh, you can probably come up with channels. I know of many channels where once they start doing a thing, they just keep on doing that thing. There's just, oh, this is my catchphrase. Hey, what's up, cool cats and kittens? <laughs> I don't know why my mind first went to damn Carol Baskin, but, um, <laughs> that kind of thing. Wazing, hey, what's up, dudes and dudettes, or whatever people do. Uh, blep, blebity blap, it's time for a new unwrap. I, I don't know if anybody actually says that, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, all those kind of little things, soundbitey things. I don't want to do that. I, I, so I'm not going to. So, uh, how, do I, how am I, I going to end this one? I guess just like that. There we go. This one's done. <laughs>